You're I'm ready. ready. Yeah, sure. Okay. Yeah, I'm ready. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, uh, welcome to another statistical conf uh, statistical seminar. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Yan Xin Shui, today's speaker. She is assistant professor in the Department of Applied Mathematics and Statistics at Johns Hopkins University. Uh, her research interests mainly focus on the development of Bayes theory and methods for a broad range of statistical problems, such as high-dimensional data analysis non-parametric problems, uncertainty quantification, and large heterogeneous data problems. Uh, she also developed new Bayesian methods for various applications, including electronic health records, dynamic treatment regime, which I think is today's main topic, cancer genomics, early detection of Alzheimer disease, mental health in people with HIV, early phase clinical trial designs, and material engineering. So uh, today, Dr. Xu is going to tell us about her recent work, very recent work, on personalized dynamic treatment regimes in continuous time, a Bayesian joint model for optimizing clinical decision with timing. Let's welcome our speaker. Okay. Uh, thanks, Yang, for your nice introduction. <laughs> uh, it's my great pleasure to present my research at Texas and m and I hope I can visit the department very soon in person. Uh, so this is a joint work with my PhD student, William Hua, and also a PhD student in uh, Hopkins Computer Science Department, Hong Yuan, and also my two collaborators from France, so Sarah Zoha in uh, INSERM in France, and also Migali, so she's a clinician uh, behind this work. And also I would like to acknowledge the funding source from both NIH and also NSF. And the, here is a paper link. So uh, this work is motivated by the electronic health medical record data from kidney transplant kidneys. So as we all know, many diseases could cause kidney failure, such as sepsis or diabetes. So once a patient's kidney function cannot, uh, cannot work properly, and then kidney transplantation is one of the mainstream treatments for patients with kidney failure. So after the transplantation, as a maintenance therapy, the patients will need to take some immunosuppressive drugs, uh, tacrolimus, every day. And also, from time to time, the clinician, uh, the patients need to follow up with their clinician. And at each visit, the patient's medical record will be mirrored. Then the doctor, based on the patient's medical history, the doctor will assign a a new dosage level of tacrolimus and determine the next follow-up visitation time. And then this process will proceed until the patient is a die or the graft kidney field and the patients return to dialysis. So this process is similar to many diseases with chronic conditions and also for many other applications like mobile health, they all have the data structure like this kind of framework. So here is the data from one example patient. Here the blue line indicates the creatinine level that's at log scale. So you may notice the unit is different from the American scale because the data from France. So it's European standard for the unit for the creatinine level. So the higher value of the creatinine is then the worse the kidney function is. So the red line here is the patient's tacrolimus level. And we can see at the very beginning, the creatinine level is high, so that indicates the kidney is not functioning very well. So the tacrolimus is also high because the doctor wants to uh, increase the, you know, the suppressive function from the tacrolimus, so the, uh, the kidney can function better. And then it becomes more stable after then, and then we can see the drug dosaging also decreasing and it became stable. So for such kind of electronic medical or health record data, we have several goals. First, we would like to understand how the creatinine changes along the time. So since creatinine is a very important index to measure the kidney function, understanding how creatinine changes over time will help us understand how the graph to kidney works. And in statistics, we usually use longitudinal modeling to understand the creatinine changes over time. And secondly, we also want to study how the creatinine affects survival. And we know if the graft function does not work well, then the patient will be very likely to experience graft failure, leading to death or returning to dialysis. 
So if you want to study how a uh, longitudinal measurement affects survival in statistics, in statistics, we have a rich literature on joint modeling of longitudinal data and the survival. The third goal is to learn how doctors treat patients. So meaning that we need to learn how doctors schedule their visitations and the dosages. So like I showed in the first slide, at each visit, the doctor need to assign a dosage and then schedule the next visit. So we need to learn how to schedule the visits and the dosage. So after we learn all those things, the last goal is to find an optimal visitation and dosing strategy to maximize survival outcomes. So that's related to an optimization framework. So that's for major goals from uh, such kind of electronic health record data. Okay, so to learn the optimal visitation schedule and the treatment, uh, so there's, we first need to estimate the treatment effects from this longitudinal observational data. So in statistics, the data containing sequential treatment assignments has been studied extensively using the dynamic treatment regime method, it's DTR methods. For example, like G-computation and also G-estimation of structural nest models by Robbins Group. And also more recently, we have the IPTW and double robust IPTW method and a lot of variations and extensions of this line of research. And another related topic in reinforcement learning is off policy evaluation of the sequential treatment schedule. So in computer science or machine learning, we call it off policy reinforcement learning or off policy policy search. So for example, like contextual bandits and the sequential decision making problems by a lot of people. However, all those methods, they do not model the timing of the clinical decision. So that means, you know, when we need to schedule the patient's next visitation time. So because they don't model those kind of, so they cannot optimize the timing of clinical decisions. So the main contribution of this work is not only we learn how, you know, the longitudinal modeling, how creatinine changes over time, and also how creatinine affects the survival and we also model the clinical decisions relating to the visitation schedule and also the dosage assignment so that we can put everything into a Bayesian framework and then optimize the clinical decisions. So here is an approach overview. So to achieve all these goals we develop a Bayesian joint model. So first we model the clinical decision. So here the clinical decision includes the timing of the visitation and the dosages at each visit. And then condition on the treatment history, so including all those you know, dosages and the visitation schedules. And we, we also model, we jointly model the longitudinal measurement. Here is creatinine level and also the survival, the survival time. So this joint model on the longitudinal survival visitation and the dosage data, they learn what actually happened in the data set. And then after this joint model, learning the, what actually happened in the data set, we propose an optimization procedure to optimize the parameters involved in the clinical decision, right? Because the, the, what doctors can control is the visitation schedule and also the dosage they assign. So we propose an optimization procedure to optimize the parameters involved in the clinical action model. So meaning the parameters related to the visitation and the dosage to maximize patient survival. So here the reward specifically in our application is patient survival, but in other applications you can assign different awards function. So here is an approach overview. Uh, so first I will talk about how to model the visitation and the dosages. So that's a key part of our model. For the visitation and the dosages, we often call those kind of those data as event extreme as event streams data. So event streams data usually involve sequences of time stepped data. So here we have a time stepped event T and D. So here T represents the time of an event, and D is an associated event. And also the timing of an event and the mark also have depends on the history. So here we don't denote the history. So for example, in online shopping, each, each online shopper has a sequence of page views and the purchases and the item reviews. So when the customer comes back to the site and what will be purchased 
may be predictable after reading the purchase record. Another type of data is like social media, like Twitter or Facebook. So each social media user, they has a sequence of posts and shares. So when the user will post again, and what he would post about may be influenced by the past posts and the shares. So for example, here it's obvious this user is a sports fan. In our kidney transplantation application, the, each patient has a sequence of visitations and each visitation, the physicians assign a dosage D. So, and also the next clinic, the clinical visit, visit timing depends on the medical history. In our case, it's measurements of a kidney function. So here, each T will represent the timing of each visitation of, on, in the clinic, and the D is a dosage assigned at each visitation. Okay, so for this kind of event streams data, we usually use point process to model that. So we assume an intensity function, and then this intensity function models how likely the event, so that means the visitation will happen. So the event happens in, in, the, in the period from time t to time t plus dt, that's a very small uh, time duration. Conditional, conditional the history. So to design a flexible conditional intensity function that takes into account patient's kidney condition measured by creatinine levels and the capture patient's heterogeneity in visitation times, we first plot the data. So here we first plot the empirical density in the left panel and the visitation intensity in the right panel from our data set. So first we can see here in the left panel, we plot the visitation density. So first here different colors represent the different creatinine levels. So we can see the black line is for very high creatinine level is larger than 250 and the green line is for the relatively high 250, and red line is medium, and creatinine low is blue color. So we can see the patients with high creatinine levels, they indicating the unstable kidney function has shorter times between follow-up times, right? So they have higher density here. And also from the intensity function, you can see the similar, you can see the similar patterns. And also we can see the from the empirical intensity function, they are, very, they are highly skilled. So you can see we have a high peaks at the beginning. So after like 10 or 20, from 10 to 20 days, and then the, the intensity becomes smaller, is relatively stable after this high peak. And we also we can see there's a small peak around from 80 to 100 days because now the regular clinical practice usually requires the patients to visit the clinic every three months after the uh, after the kidney transplantation. So that's why you know, see we have a small peak here at 90 days. So we can see here for different creatinine levels, the timing when the peak happens, they are pretty consistent. So you see they're almost the same, but however, the level, the height of the intensity curves are very different. So that's what how our data tells us, right? So that's the pattern in the data. So how can we model these kind of patterns? The commonly used point of process, for example, like Poisson process, gamma process, or Hox process, they have their own respective properties. So for example, we know for the Poisson process, they assume a constant intensity, right? So it obviously does not fit our data. And also like a gamma process, the gamma process indicates a monotone intensity. Also, it doesn't fit to our data. So another widely used point of process is the Hox process. And Hox process assumes the influences from past events are linearly additive towards the current event. We call it self-exciting property. And this also does not capture the latent dynamics of the follow-up schedules in our kidney transportation data because not, it doesn't really the case, you know, if people visit more frequently at the beginning, they will visit more and more frequently, right? Because the, our visit, visitation uh, frequency actually depends on patient's creatinine level. Since all those commonly used point processes cannot capture the patterns in our data, and then we propose a new, uh, a new point process. So this new point process borrows 
the idea from gamma density. So we see the curve is kind of similar to the gamma density, right? So you have a curve, you have a peak at the beginning, and then it gets relatively st stable as the as the end. And also, we can see our data. The peak here depends on the creatinine levels. So we want a new we want a new intensity function that can possess all those properties. So we borrow the gamma density function as follows. So here is what we proposed for the uh, intensity function in this point process. So we assume the, the intensity between the time Tij to Tij plus one. So here I index patients and J index their visitation. So between the visitation J to J plus one, we assume their intensity as the follows. So first they have a baseline intensity. So that's modeled as exponential mu. And then we borrow this gamma density to model the intensity before this, uh, beyond this baseline intensity. So here, the Tij, because here we are modeling the intensity between the time Tij to Tij plus one. So we see for any time between this time period, and then they have this property, this gamma density. So here, the alpha, so here the TIR corresponds to most recent visitation time, and also the kappa and the gamma is a shape parameter and also skew parameter in the gamma function. So for ease of interpretation, we reparameterize the mu here as kappa minus one over gamma, so that's a parameter in the gamma function, is a shape and a skew function, so that the exponential of beta nu one can be interpreted as the timing when the peak of the intensity function occurs. And also we assume the kappa here as the exponent, exponential of beta nu two plus one because the, for the gamma distribution, if the shape is smaller than one, then it's monotonically decreasing. But we don't want this monotonically decreasing property in our intensity function, so we reparameterize the ka uh, kappa as the exponential of beta nu two larger than one, so the kappa will strictly larger than one. And also if we denote the yitij as yij, and we know the intensity function, the peak here should depend on the creatinine level. So we are modeling the alpha ij, so here is a parameter controlling the peak as a parameter psi, psi over one plus exponential of x beta, so here is like, so here x is the intercept term and the yij. So that means the peak here depends on the patient's most recent creatinine level. So the higher the creatinine level, the higher peak it has. So now let's revisit the figure here. So remember here, we have this gamma density to model the intensity function, and then we do this reparameterization uh, re so we can interpret the exponential of beta nu one as a timing when the peak will happen and the kappa is strictly larger than one. And also we require the alpha ij, this parameter in the intensity function depends on the creatinine level. So here is an illustration. So basically here the peak is the alpha times the gamma density with shape parameter exponential r beta nu two. And also we see the exponential beta nu one is exactly when this peak will happen. And then the exponential mu here is a baseline intensity. Okay, so we construct this intensity function to model the pattern in our data. Now we have already seen how we model, how we use this point process to model the visitation schedule. We still have the treatments, right? We still need to model the treatment. So here, for the treatment, it's also a mark for the mark, the mark corresponding to the point of process. So we call our point of process is marked temporal point process. So for the mark, we use a simple normal distribution here because for our data, the dosage level is a continuous value, uh, is a continuous value. So for many other medical applications, it could be discrete. So you can change here to other types of model like binomial model or you know a generalized linear regression model. So here we use a just simple Gaussian model. So assume the dosage assigned for patient I at time J at the visitation J is a function of the, the creatinine level and also a bunch of baseline 
risk factors for kidney failure. So for example, we can have the donor age and also the BMI and also other potential covariates that could affect the, uh, the dosage assignment. So, and then beta D is the unknown parameter we will need to estimate, and then we assume this Gaussian error. So this also reflects the clinical knowledge that the dosage clinician assigned to the patient depends on the creatinine level and also other patient's baseline characteristics. Okay, so now let's see one example for this marked temporal point of process. Assume one patient, we have three follow-up times. So here we just simulate one trajectory based on our model. Assume at the beginning, this patient was observed with a high creatinine level at time 50, so that's at 50 days. So here I use uh, <clears throat> days as a unit. And then we can calculate, we can calculate the density and then we can randomly generate the next visitation time. So assume now we generate the next visitation time at the day 50, uh, 57 from our temporal marker prompt process. And then let's say assume at this time point, a low creatinine observed, and then we will, the intensity function will change, right? Because the intensity function always depend on the, the most recent observed creatinine level. So if a low creatinine level observed, and then we assign the dosage level, and also arrange the next visitation time. So let's see, for example, if the next follow-up visit is time is at day 80, and at that time, a medium creatinine level observed, and then we can plot the uh, intensity function as follows. Okay, so, and then we can schedule the next visitation time and also assign the dosage. So here is one example trajectory generating from our a temporal marked point process. So to summarize this part, to summarize the schedule, we represent the EITI as the sequence of the history for patient I from time zero until the capital JI. That's a total number of observed visitations. And then we can model the probability of this whole history of treatment condition on the creatinine level history and the baseline clinical characteristics and a bunch of parameters, and we can represent as this way. So first, the first term, the capital TI is our study censoring time, and we can see the first term models the probability of no visits at the T from at the beginning zero to capital TI, that's the censoring time besides the TIJ. And then the second part here models from, G, from zero at the beginning of the time zero to the visit JI, that's a probability of dosages. And the last part is a probability of visitations at time TIJ. So through this smart time from proper process, we can represent our joint model on the clinical action part using this way. Okay, so now we have already talked about how to model the visitation and the dosage. We still have two other parts, right? We still have the longitudinal creatinine level. We haven't modeled this part and also the survival time. So now let's see how can we incorporate this marked temporal point process for clinical decisions to the longitudinal and the survival modeling. So that's our joint modeling. So for the longitudinal part, we also adopt a standard way in statistics to model the creatinine level. We just use a linear mass effect model. So it's very standard. So recall the YITIJ, it's the creatinine level for patient I at visit J. So we use a linear mass effect model. Here we assume the YIT is, a, there's on the line mean process YIT star plus the error. So it's error also the function of T. And we model that as a fixed effect and a random effect and also plus the independent error. So this independent error is also a function of T. So we assume the epsilon LT just follows standard normal, or IID follows normal distribution, and the random effect also follow a normal distribution. So you can recognize it's very standard formulation uh, uh, for the linear mixed effect model. And also here, we assume the fixed effect, it has the dosage part. So we can see the both fixed effect and the random effect, we include the dosage because we know 
the dosage will affect the creatinine for the creatinine change over time, right? Because the uh, the creatinine, the dosage level, the tacrolimus level the patients actually took, and also the baseline covariance such as BMI or donor age and also some uh, delayed graft function, all those baseline co clinical covariates, they also will affect the creatinine level changes over time. So now this uh, longitudinal model actually depend, depends on the dosage. So that's part of our, our uh, marked temporal quantum process model. And the last part is the survival part. So for the survival part, and recall that the survival function is a probability of a capital T larger than T. And if you know survival function, you can also calculate their hazard and also this, uh, this, the PDF. And to model the survival, we use the hazard, we construct a model for the hazard part. So for the hazard part, we know the survival of a patient after kidney transplantation will depend on the creatinine level changes over time, right? So that's definitely, it depends on the creatinine level. It also depends on the dosage and also it depends on the visitations. So we construct our hazard in the survival model as follows to take into account the creatinine level effect, here's the Laurentino effect. So we're using this underlying mean process from the Laurentino data, from the Laurentino modeling and also we have the second part to indicate the dosage effects. So how the dosage will affect the survival of the patient. So I will talk about this toxicity part uh, very soon. And also we include the alpha IR so that controls the peak of the intensity function. So that basically controls how often this patient should visit the clinic. And here is just a, so if you see the overall structure, it's just simple variable proportional hazard model, right? But we, we are using this complex form on the baseline to model the dependence of the hazard, also the survival on the Laurentino dosage and the visitations. So here we have this toxicity part because we believe in the toxicity usually builds up over time from the drug, right? Because in general, people will think if you visit the clinic more frequently, and if you have a higher drug level, and then maybe the patient will benefit from the drug more. However, it's not the case in practice. In many applications, if you keep giving the patient a higher dose of tacrolimus, then the toxicity could build up over time. So that's why we also have this toxicity effect in the dosage part to account to adjust for this toxicity part. So for the toxicity, we use this integration function, you know, from zero to small t, and then the DIT. Here, eta toxicity is a constant, is a parameter we need to estimate, and we have this exponential decay to model the accumulated toxicity of dosage on the patient survival. Okay, so we can see our survival part model actually already depends on the longitudinal visitation and the dosage model. So that's actually how this Bayesian joint model connects all four parts of our data. So here is a joint modeling. So we have the joint modeling of YI, and that's the creatin longitudinal creatinine level. And also we have the point of process part to model the visitation and the dosage and we have the survival here, the sensory indicator. So we have three parts, right? So the first part, it's the mark the temporal point process for the visitation and the dosages. And then we have this part is for the Laurentino creatinine condition on the visitation schedule and the dosages. And also we have this part is the survival part, condition on the Laurentino creatinine and also the visitation and the dosage modeling. <coughs> So based on this joint model, and if we assign the price, and then we can do the posterior inference. So basically, the whole procedure for the posterior inference is we assign the price to all unknown parameters, and then we obtain the posterior distributions from the MCMC. So due to time limits, I will not introduce for I will not introduce the details in the MCMC, but uh, you can find more details in the paper. Okay. <clears throat> So until now, uh, we have can already I ask a solved the first three. Can I ask yeah, a question? Sure. 
Uh, yeah, the last slide actually. The, the last. Okay. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, the blue part and green part. So in the blue part, you have this the one or of, the previous one. Uh, this one. This one. This one. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so the blue, blue, blue part, you have the distribution mm. of A given Y, right? Action set and Y. And in the green part, you have Y given A. Mm. Is the joint distribution yeah. well defined in this case? The joint distribution Y and A well defined or is some type of pseudo likelihood? Oh, that's uh, that's a very good question. So there are some actually some details here because here we have AITI actually, you know, the uh, the current creatinine level. So here is actually YT. It determines the the next visitation time and dosage, right? But here the creatinine depends on the previous time. Oh, so there's some, yeah, there's a chain rule. involved here. So it's a chain yes. rule. Of, okay. Thanks. Yes, that's correct. Okay, so now we have already talked about this Bayesian joint model on the creatinine longitudinal creatinine survival and also visitation and the dosage model. So we basically learn what actually happened in the data, right? But we still have the most important goal. So here is how to find an optimal visitation and the dosing strategy to maximize the survival outcome. So the rest of the part is optimization procedure. It's not related to Bayesian anymore. So it's an optimization procedure. So the, for this optimization procedure, we basically based on this joint model, we need to optimize the action part, right? Because the clinician, they cannot control how the creatinine will change along the time and also how the survival will depend on the creatinine level and the visitations. The part the clinicians can actually control is the parameters that only appear in the dosage and the visitations. So in our model, we call those parameters as action parameters. So here we call the action, we borrow the term from reinforcement learning. And then we call all other parameters, the clinicians have no control as environmental parameters. So basically we need to maximize the expected value of a certain reward function. So here, let's say if our, we can assume our reward function is the survival time, but you can use any other reward function if necessary. So basically we want to maximize over all the action parameter data to maximize the expected value of a reward function. So the reward, the reward function is a function of our survival time. And since we have this Bayesian framework, we also have this fight, right? So when you, inter when you maximize over the theta, you still need to deal with the uncertainty in all the environmental parameters. So basically we can reparameterize, we can rewrite this goal as we want to maximize the expected value of the reward function, but you integrate out the uncertainty in all the environmental parameters. So here we can get from the distribution, the posterior distribution fine. So right, so if we get all the posterior samples from our joint MCMC, and then it's easier to evaluate this term. And also we use for the for our application we use the RITI as the media survival time. So the media survival time is a log media survival time. So basically the survival time at MI is one half. So that means RI is a log media survival time. But however, if you, uh, in other applications, for example, if you want to penalize the number of visitations, then we can add some penalty function. Let's say a constant times the number of visitations. That's also okay. okay so for this problem, it's, Actually, it's an optimization problem. And also it involves the action. And it's, you know, we, we, are, we have a model for the action. So in reinforcement learning, there's a technique called policy gradient method. So we use, so in this work, we just adopt the policy gradient method to optimize our actions. So basically, let's assume our G theta is the expected value of our reward function after integrating out the uncertainties in the environment model. So here the environment means all the parameters related to the creatinine and the survival. And then we employ a stochastic gradient descent method. So the basic idea of stochastic gradient descent is every time you, you, you update the next, uh, next step value is the previous step value plus a Turing parameter alpha L, and then you calculate the gradient of the G theta, that's your objective function. And then you can use the 
SGD to find the optimal value. However, in our case, this, this derivative with respect to theta is relatively hard, right? Because here the RATI, this reward function, it depends on the whole temporal mark, the point of process, and also your longitudinal process. So it's very complicated here. But luckily for us, the, we can actually calculate the stochastic gradient of this expected value of the reward and as this form. So the, again, the detailed proof is in the paper, so I will skip the proof. But basically, we can calculate the gradient as the integration of the expected value with respect to phi and the theta, then our reward function times the gradient of log likelihood part related to the visitation and the dosages. So we can actually calculate this part. Okay, so, and then here is the algorithm for the optimizing theta. So we basically, we first initialize theta and then we sample the, so based on our model, you sample the history of the visitation and the schedule and also the correct Lartino creatinine and then you can compute the corresponding RI. And then after you compute the corresponding RI, and then you can calculate the mean reward. And then based on the mean reward, you can calculate the gradient and then you use the stochastic gradient descent method and we can update our optimal action parameters. That's also our optimal policy, meaning the optimal visitation schedules and also the dosages assigned at each visitation time. Okay, uh, so now let's see the simulation studies. Uh, we simulate 1,000 patients and also uh, each patient we simulate a random number of visits. So in this study we have about 20, so we simulate the 28, over 28,000 total visits. So we simulate this large data set just to mimic the real data in our French, you know, French uh, kidney transplantation data sets. And then in the simulation, we considered three baseline covariates. So donor age, BMI, and also delivered graph function. And here we plot four example patient trajectories. So here is a log creatinine level. So we can see the censoring time for each patient are different. And also their log creatinine and the log dosages are very different. Okay. So first we applied the Bayesian joint model. So we have the Bayesian joint model that's a, that consists of a temporal mark point process for visitation schedules and, uh, and uh, dosages. And we have the arterial uh, linear mix effect model for the creatinine levels. And also we have the uh, survival part. So we first fit this joint model to the data and then we run our MCMC. So here I just show randomly three parameters, the uh, trace plot. So just say they are converged as well. And, up, and also we, uh, and also all the parameters estimation are very accurate. So it's expected, so I'll just skip that part. And then after we fit the model and then we run the optimization procedure. So for example, here we get two hypothetical patients. So for the first patient, we assume the DGF is zero and the donor age is 50.2 and the BMI is 24. For the second patient, we can see the DGF is one and the donor age is relatively younger and also the BMI is 24.8. So we can see here is SJD iterations. Uh, for the initial value of the SJD iterations, we used the posterior mean from our MCMC pro procedure. So here we use the posterior mean from the MCMC procedure is because the, our Bayesian joint model actually learns what actually happened, right? So that means what clinicians actually assigned the visitation schedule and the dosages to the patients. So we assume those practices already close to optimal, but it still has the room for us to improve. So we use the posterior mean as the initial value. So from these two hypothetical patients, we can see our procedure can indeed increase their media survival time. So here is a mean reward. So we can see if you use the posterior mean from the initial value, and then you can see it started increases along the, so we run the 1000 iterations. And also we can compare the optimized action values from the 
uh, for these two hypothetical patients compared to their posterior mean. So here, the theta zero tilde is a posterior mean from the MCMC, and the theta tilde S1 and the theta tilde S2 here is the optimized value through the SGD from this optimization procedure. So we have following parameters related to the action. So first we can see for patient S1, the optimal beta D and the beta D2, so that's the parameters in the dosage part, they are actually lower, right? So you see the initial value is 0.864 here, but our optimized value is 0.746, uh, and also beta D2. So we can see these two values for the patient was lower, indicating the preference for lower dosages compared to what actually were prescribed for the patients in the data. In contrast, for the patient S2, those two values were larger. So that means we should assign the higher dosage levels compared to what they were actually received. And also we can see the dosage error term, the sigma D square. So we can see that for the sigma D square, the optimized value for both patients, they were significantly lower than the initial value. So indicating a lower variance in the dosaging procedure would benefit the patient's survival. And also we can see the baseline visitation intensity. So both of them, they were lower compared to, their, uh, compared to the original value, but they're roughly the same as the posterior mean, right? So the difference is very, very small. So indicating the simulated follow-up schedules are, was already close to optimal. But for the visitation intensity, parameters new one and new two. So for example, we can say for this parameter it's lower and for this parameter is larger. So that means we want this patient visits more frequently, but this patient visits less frequently. And also we can see the uh, change. So the initial, if we use the initial, the posterior mean from the MCMC, and then the media survival time is 2,111, but the optimal, optimized value will be 2,209 2, days. And for patient S2, it increased from 2203 to 2383. So we can see the change from the uh, initial media survival time. Okay, so that's for the study of two hypothetical patients. And we also want to demonstrate the advantage of optimizing to our strategy of optimizing both follow-up schedules and advantage uh, and the dosages. So we compare our method with alternative strategies based on regular visits. We consider three, uh, three alternative strategies. So the regular visits every one month, three months, and six months. So here, these two plots shows the density of 100 random realizations of the predictive media survival time under our method and these three alternative strategies for the two, these two hypothetical patients. And we can see our method significantly, it's, our method results in significantly longer media survival time compared to these three alternative methods. So it demonstrates the advantage of our strategy of optimizing both visitation and also the uh, dosages. Okay, so here is the simulation results. So the last part is about the real data. So our data, the kidney transplantation, uh, kidney transplantation data from the DVAT database. So it's uh, a France database over, they have over 10,000 uh, kidney trans transplantation patients. So we have certain inclusion criteria and also exclusion criteria. And for those patients, at each time, at each visit, you will measure their creatinine level and also the weight and protein euro, there's other covariates. And also we have their dosage of the tacro lemons. And at each follow-up, we also have those measurements. And then for the end point of each patient, either the death or the graph failure, and they return to dialysis. So that's a whole data structure. And for the DVAT database, we have 947 patients, and in total, they have 48,642 total visits. And the baseline covariates used in our model is donor age, recipient age, delayed, delayed graft function, BMI, diabetes history, and donor type. So all those covariates were already studied in previous 
kidney transplantation literature showing that there are important risk factors for kidney failure. And here is a data, data set summary statistics. And then first, let's look at the results from the Bayesian joint modeling. So we first apply our Bayesian joint model to estimate the parameters in this, you know, the visitation schedule and dosage and creatinine level and the survival model. So here is there all the parameters. So here we plot the parameter related to the dosage and here the parameter related to the longitudinal part and here is the uh, parameter related to the survival. So for example, here we can see for the creatinine level, it's positively affect the hazard, right? So that means the higher creatinine level is and then the higher hazard this person has. So it's harmful for patient survival. So it's, it's expected. And also the tacrolimus level, we can see we have two parts. So the tacrolimus and toxicity, so they also have opposite direction. So the tacrolimus itself, it helps survival, but the toxicity, it will be harmful. And also we have the visitation and the shape parameter. And also, for example, we can see the dosage here. So we can see the creatinine is significantly negatively correlated with the dosage. So that means if you have the, uh, if you have the high creatinine level, and then, so here it means you have the lower dosage level. Okay, and also the DGF is also negatively correlated with the dosage. So most of these findings are consistent with what's reported in the clinical literature. And then we also apply the optimization procedure after the Bayesian joint modeling to see what's the optimal, uh, to see what's the optimal policy or optimal treatment regimes for two patients. So here we randomly choose two patients from our data set. The patient R1 is 60 years old with a BMI of 17, no history of diabetes, no DGF, and received donation from a 61-year-old non-living donor. And the patient R2 is a much younger patient, is 28 years old with BMI 25.5, also no history of diabetes, no DGF, and received a kidney from a living 29-year-old donor. So first we can see, because the patient R2 is younger and also receiving the kidney from a living donor, we can see there, uh, there's a larger increase from the initial value. So again, here the initial value is the posterior mean from the MCMC computation. Okay, so we can see the R1, they increase about like 100 days uh, in the median survival time. And for the patient R2, it's also about 100 days. Okay, so here we can see our method can actually help to improve the patient's uh, survival after we optimize their visitation schedules and the dosages. And lastly, we <coughs> and lastly, we also compare our method to different strategies to emphasize the importance of optimizing both visitation schedules and the dosages. So here we compare four different policies. So first here, non-optimization, this policy, we only use the parameter from the MCMC. So that means we use the posterior means from the MCMC and then get their predictive media survival time. And here optimization visits means we only optimize the visits, but we keep the parameters in the dosage part the same as the posterior mean. And optimized dosage means we only optimize the parameters in dosage, but keep the, param keep the parameter values as a posterior mean in the visitation part. And then optimization, optimization both method is our method. So you optimize both visitation schedules and the dosages. So here we can see for two patients, the first patient, it benefits from the visitation, you optimize the visitation. And then it benefits even more when you further optimize the dosage. And then if you optimize both, you see you have the highest expected media survival time. And also for the patient R2, it's the message a little bit different. So we can see the patient R2, it doesn't benefit a lot from optimization of the visitation. So that means for this patient, the visitation you observed in the data may be already close to optimal. 
However, when you optimize the dosage, you see the significant, uh, the significant benefit. Okay. And again, if you compare the optimization both, and then it still performs better compared to these three alternative strategies. So again, this analysis, uh, analysis reviews the importance and also you know, how our method can clearly benefit patients in terms of prolonging their survival time. Okay, so to conclude, we propose a Bayesian joint model for longitudinal data and the survival data and the contribution beyond the traditional, uh, traditional statistical literature is we also has additional parts on using the, tempor the market temporal point process to model the visitation schedules and the dosages. And then after the Bayesian joint model, we propose a stochastic gradient descent method based on the policy gradient search method to find the optimal strategy. And thereby we can optimize patients' visitation schedules and their dosages at each visitation. So the current framework can easily incorporate other costs in the reward. So for example, we can incorporate the healthcare costs and also we could uh, penalize the number of visitations. Uh, so there are some other potential uh, extensions. So for example, currently this Bayesian joint model relies on a lot of parametrical assumptions, right? For example, linear mixed effect model parts, and also for the survival part, we have the proportional hazard assumption. So when we have, so those assumptions are made for this specific data set, but when you have more complex applications, we might be able to extend the current framework to say like Bayesian non-parametric models to make the whole framework more flexible. Uh, but the optimization part might be a little bit more complex if we change the current Bayesian framework to non-parametric Bayesian framework. Um, and also uh, we build our package, it's called DOCT. So I like this acronym very much. It indicates the decisions optimized in continuous time. So we have also posted the, our package in GitHub. So the link is also in the uh, archive paper. So here the archive link is for the paper and the, our package link is also in the paper. Okay, uh, thank you for questions. I think it's right time. Uh, thank you very much. This is a very nice talk. Um, do we have any questions for Dr. Xu? So, um, I'd like to just, to just ask, uh, how did you validate this model? This model? Um, so you specified, specified a complicated Bayesian statistics for these data, mm. and you did some simulation studies where I simulated from that, from that model. Um, uh, how did you actually, actually validate it with a patient data, data, and how did you know that the model, that the model fits the data? Oh, so <clears throat> it's a very good question. So to validate the model, I would say, the gold standard is we run the prospective trial, right? Uh, because I think that's the only way you can implement different strategies and then say which strategy is the best for patients. So however, in our data set, so there's, we cannot really run the prospective trials. So to, to validate our method, maybe I wouldn't say it's a validation, but here, you know, for example, for these two hypothetical patients, we actually used the you know, like we use the parameters estimates from the Bayesian joint model. So that's kind of mimic what actually happened in the data. So first we checked the model actually fits the data well. So first we checked the goodness of fits and the model fits data well. So we can, uh, we can regard the parameter so estimates how, how from did the- you, How did you, how did you, how did you check the goodness? So for the goodness of fit, we, uh, we use the, uh, the WASC criteria, and we also compare to different models. So for example, uh, again, everything is numeric. So I wouldn't say it's the gold standard for validation. So everything is numeric. So we compare to some alternative models by simplifying some assumptions of our model, and then we get the best model selection criteria <laughs> based on the WASC. So that's not actually actually a goodness of fit variant. I mean, that's a model, some model selection criteria. Um, I guess also, also, I mean, you could go through and you. How would you? I, I, I mean, what would be the? Uh, uh, 
procedure that you would actually usually use to implement in such a trial, a prospective trial? Because I guess you would have to, you would have to have software where doctors were entering data after every clinical visit, clinical visit and they would run a Markov chain Monte Carlo algorithm to determine, determine when the visit was. I mean, um, how practical would it be to be to implement this model? Uh, <clears throat> so I wouldn't, I would say for this kidney transplantation data set, it may not be feasible because they're, you know, their visitation schedules, it's very complex and it, it spans for many, many years. So it's not really feasible. However, I'm currently talking to uh, several HIV clinicians at Hopkins. We're actually discussing to implement this method to a HIV data set. So for their clinical practices, uh, for the HIV patients, and they will mirror some of their uh, clinical measurements and then based on the clinical measurements, they will need to, so they, currently they already have a standard procedure and then they have one alternative, uh, one alternative strategy. They want to depend, they want to implement our model to determine, say, what's the back, the, what's the optimal uh, timing for the next treatment and also what's the optimal dosage. For that setup, I would say, the, so current, that prospective trial, I think it's more feasible because first all the patients are in hospital and then, you know, we can, <clears throat> it's a relatively short time period. Uh, so it's relatively easier to control the, uh, control the clinical trial. And also for the technical uh, challenge, I, I agree. So it's a lot of computation, you know, we first need to uh, have, we first need to run this Bayesian MCMC models. And also for this, uh, for this temporal mark point process, even we optimize the parameters there is still a lot of randomness when you generate the patient's optimal next visitation time and also their uh, timing. So currently we're still working. So we just start to you know, discuss the implementation of this kind of method to the real clinical trials. Um, so there are yeah, still a lot of challenges to be solved. So thank you Valen, for your questions. Do you have any other question for the speaker? Well, I just have one very minor question. So when you have, I uh, forgot your notation, but for alpha, which is the, the note, uh, where you have a beta alpha in your model that basically models um, how, how, how high is the intensity function is, given different creatinine level, right? So yeah. you have this component. Um, did you constrain, did you make some constraint of this type of parameter? But as you know that, as you see from the data, you know, when your creatinine level is higher, the peak is higher. So you constrain, mm -hmm. let's say beta alpha to be positive in your model and similar to other parameters that you can, you know, you have observation from the data, you can sort of constrain them in the posterior, in the prior distribution. Um. Yeah, that's a very good question. So first, yeah, we indeed have some clinical knowledge. So for example, we could say impose a certain directionality for the parameters beta alpha and also even for the parameters in the survival part. Remember, like we have the yeah. uh, we have the we have how the hazard function depends on the toxicity and the dosage, right? So uh, so there are a lot of clinical knowledges here we can incorporate. Uh, however, in the detailed implementation, we <clears throat> we didn't really impose this constraint because you know the if you impose this like strictly positive, you might need to use log normal or gamma, and then it will destroy the conjugacy of the MCMC computation. So to be honest, the computation behind this model is already very, very complex, and also in the optimization procedure, you know, this policy gradient descent method also has a lot of variability in the context of reinforcement learning. So that's why we didn't really impose a specific constraint, except for the RFI itself, it has to be positive. So we assume the, that Kasai parameter is, we give a gamma pi because there's, you know, anyway, there's no close, there's no conjugate pi for the R for, for alpha. So we just give the a gamma mm. pi on this parameter to be make it strictly positive but for other parameters we have the close we have the conjugated price we just assume basically most of them are its normal distributions yeah but luckily okay. for us i think most of our 
findings, it's it's consistent with the clinical knowledge. <laughs> yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you. Do we have any other questions? Well, if there's no further question, let's thank our speaker for a very interesting talk. Okay. Thank you. All. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Nice to meet you, everyone. Yeah, see you hopefully soon in person. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Bye.